this may seem a bit of a an off topic to be talking about at the moment. Um, it's something that was uh, a debate on Twitter a week or two ago about the modes of production in the USA that I got involved with. So I thought I would let produce a video on it. And since then, obviously, the world situation has got much worse. The war in uh, Lebanon is becoming extreme and who knows what's going to happen. But since I started producing this video, I'll continue with it. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what do, is meant by a mode of production. And I'm going to take a number of quotes from Capital on that. First one says, Peasant agriculture on a small scale and the carrying out of independent half handicrafts, which together form the basis of the feudal mode of production, and after the dissolution of that system, continue side by side with the capitalist mode, also form the economic basis of classical com communities at their best, after the primitive form of common land ownership had disappeared and before slavery had seized on production in earnest. So he's talking here about a great span of time. And let's look at what uh, the references are. Classical communities, he means Greece and Rome before slavery dominated. When he talks of small-scale agriculture continuing side by side with the capitalist mode, he's talking about what was typical then in 19th century France. Another example from Capital about what he means by a mode of production. He says, We've seen that the expropriation of the mass of people from the soil forms the basis for the capitalist mode of production. The essence of a free colony, on the contrary, consists in this, that the bulk of the soil is still, in private, is still public property, and every settler can therefore turn part of it to his private property an individual means of production, without hinder hindering later settlers in the same operation. Now, this passage is absolutely uh, essential to understanding the history of the United States. Note that Marx is contrasting a free colony like the USA with the capitalist mode of production. He's saying the mode of production in a free colony is quite distinct from capitalism. Another example. Again, this is very relevant to the United States. About 25 years ago, the ratio expressing the relative value of gold to silver was 15.5 to 1. Now it's approximately 22 to 1. And silver is still constantly falling against gold. This is essentially the result of a revolution in the mode of production of both metals. Formerly gold was obtained almost exclusively by washing it out from gold-bearing alluvial deposits, products of the weathering of auriferous auriferous rock. Now this method is alt altogether inadequate and has been forced into the background by the processing of the quartz loads themselves, a way of extraction that was formerly of very secondary importance, although well known to the ancients. Moreover, not only when huge new silver deposits discovered in North America, in the western part of the Rocky Mountains, but these and the Mexican silver mines were really opened up by the laying of railways, which made the possible shipment of modern machinery and fuel, and in consequence of the mining of silver on a very large scale at low cost. Now this is passage has a lot of importance for the future argument. Note what he's talking about here. He's saying that the mode of production of gold and silver had undergone a revolution. And this revolution was one which involved the use of machinery on a large scale and the use of fuel. Another example, he says, in manufacture, the revolution in the mode of production begins with labour power. In modern industry, it begins with the instruments of labour. Our first inquiry, then, is how the instruments of labour 
are converted from tools into machines? Or what is the difference between a machine and the implements of our handicraft? The machine, which is the starting point of the Industrial Revolution, supersedes the workman who handles a single tool by a mechanism operating with a number of single t similar tools set in motion by a single motive power, whatever the form of that power may be. Now he's focusing in on machines as the key to the capitalist mode of production. And the revolution in the mode of production in manufacture comes with the machine. So what do modes of production and revolutions in the mode of production refer to? They refer to the actual material process by which things are made. Handicraft production is quite different from machine industry. And the latter is a capitalist mode of production because it uses machines. Small peasant production, he says, was the basis of feudal mode of production and also the mode of production in Rome until slavery came to dominate. So this is very specific. When he's talking about the mode of production, he's talking about the way things are actually physically produced. Now, you actually require property relations in order that a new mode of material production can operate. If a new mode of production like machine industry comes into existence, there also have to be changes in the form of property. The direct producers must be separated from the soil and moved into towns where they work in factories. So separation from the soil is a key condition of it. Now this is essential to understanding US history. Next thing is how is a surplus obtained. There are two ways it can be done. By absolute surplus labour, which is achieved by lengthening the working day beyond the point at which there is enough work done to feed people and support them. Now, absolute surplus labour exists in multiple systems of social relations. You get absolute surplus labour in feudalism, you get absolute surplus labour in capitalism, you get absolute surplus labour in slavery. Because in slave society and feudal society, the slaves and serfs are forced to work longer than would be required just to feed themselves. Now, what's innovative about the capitalist mode of production is that it uses relative surplus labour. And this requires a cheapening of the means of subsistence so that they can be produced with fewer hours so that a smaller portion of the working day is enough to support workers, even if the working day remains the same. And this is a, something which is specific to capitalist machine industry because it's machines which greatly reduce the labour time required to produce food and clothing. The first revolution occurred in the clothing industry, in cotton, and later mechanised agriculture took over. Now, what is required for the process of primitive accumulation? Firstly, you require a class of landless labourers. You require the separation of the producers from the land. Next, you require a surplus population who is working Ma producing railways, factories, steelworks, etc. Now, historically, this required a rise in the productivity in Department 1 to create a material surplus layer. That, for example, was produced by having steam engines in the mines, so the productivity of mines went up, um, the use of powered blast furnaces, which increased the productivity of iron production, and powered machine tools rather than hand tools. You also need a surplus of food to support this group of workers who are building the new capital stock, new means of production. And this requires a rise in agricultural productivity and a rise in the efficiency of producing consumer goods. That's to say, a surplus in Department 2, in Marx's terms. For example, the use of mechanical harvesters and industrially produced fertilizers increased productivity in food production. 
the mass production of basic consumer goods like cotton cloth, cast iron, cookwares, etc. All of these transformations in productivity allowed relative surplus value to be produced. Now, what does Marx say is the peculiarity of settler economies? Well, you have the availability of frontier land. It means that there is no classical landlord class. Once the native nations of the West had been conquered, any tenant farmer could move to the frontier. Only, the only landlord class you could get in North America were slave owners who could prevent their workforce leaving and heading off to the frontier. Now, although workers could head to the frontier, free workers could head to the frontier, they could leave cities in the east and move west. To do that, they needed other means of production. The land might be for, there for the taking, but they need horses, oxen, tools, seed corn. And this required credit from the banking class. And this credit was given against mortgages on the land that they were acquiring. Again, this is key to understanding the subsequent class relations in America. Something that is quite surprising is how late the transition to capitalism was in the United States. It was late to industrialize. This is a graph comparing the degree of urbanization of the United Kingdom against the degree of urbanization in the United States. And until the, let's say, mid 20th century, the United States was about a century behind the United Kingdom in its, in its rate of industrialization. It was a predominantly agricultural nation well into the 20th century. It was less urbanized in 1900 than the UK was in 1800. Now, the primitive accumulation phase in the United States was tied closely to changes in the value of gold and silver that Marx was talking about. The US originally had a currency based on the silver dollar. From 1873, the US adopted the gold standard. Now, Marx was saying when he wrote Capital, which was 1860s, that the value of gold was appreciating relative to silver. And for the 30 years after going on to the gold standard, the value of gold rose against silver. This means that loans that farmers had taken out in valued in the old silver dollars or even valued in the paper money of the Civil War period, these loans had to be paid back in dollars that were now tied to gold, whose value was therefore rising. And the payback became ever more onerous. And this is re reflected in the fact that the real price of the agricultural products they were producing fell in terms of gold dollars. So the red line shows the fall in the agricultural prices. And note this is a log graph. So this is a very big fall. It may look small, but it's a, it's, it's a very large fall. And the... I've, I've used a log graph in order to compress what were very big changes over a period of time onto a, a visible range. And there's a very sharp rise in the value of gold. Now, there's a brief period of relative prosperity due to the inflation caused by World War I. And then the process set in again. Gold appreciated relative to silver, agricultural prices collapse. So there were two periods of extreme distress for the peasant class in the United States. I mean, the Americans now don't call their farmers peasants. But in if you read 19th century European literature, like Weber, 
they openly refer to the settlers as the American peasantry. This distress came in two waves, first in the late 19th century and then again in the 1930s. Uh, it produced big political effects. The populist movement in the US was a response to this distress. And uh, Bryant's famous, famous cross of gold, let, why should mankind be crucified on a cross of gold speech, was based on that, on the impact the appreciation of gold was having on the debts of the mass of the farming class in the United States. So what happens? The farmers are dispossessed. Most evidently, almost extremely, in the, from the period from the late 20s to, to the mid-1930s. Mass dispossession of farmers, which allowed the banks to foreclose on the farms, driving farmers into the cities, and moving the US agricultural system from peasant farming to the agribusiness, which now exists. Now, in the South, you didn't have free peasantry. You'd had slaves. But after the Civil War, the laws of history don't get abolished and slavery gives way to feudalism or to semi-feudal relations, sharecropping, just as it did in Gaul, where slave agriculture gave way way to col what was called the, the colonnade, the system of semi-servile serfdom, which laid the basis for feudalism. You had sharecropping, which was basically carrying out the same material mode of production as slavery, hand labour to pick cotton. What happened in the 1930s was that mechanised agriculture came along, machine picking machines came along, and the landlord castes could then dispossess the semi-feudal peasantry in the south, replacing them with cotton picking machines. So, at the same time, you have the sharecroppers evicted from their lands. On the one hand, the banks were dispossessing the free peasantry, on the other hand, the landlord class in the south was dispossessing the sharecroppers. Now, I said previously you couldn't get a landlord class, but you could, couldn't get a landlord class in a free colony so long as the frontier was open. Effectively, the black former slaves were not free to move to the frontier. Therefore, they were trapped in semi-feudal relations. Now, if you contrast the way capitalism arose in Britain with that in the United States, you see a different set of forms. The English transition was you start off with serfs doing labour rent for the Lord. Then the upper class commutes the rent from labour rent into money rent. So the peasants have to pay a money rent but they, as a result, are forced to become petty commodity producers in order to pay the money rent. Next step is the landlords enclose the land and rent it out to capitalist farmers who employ the f former peasants as landless agricultural labourers. You then get population growth and rural mechanisation which forces a population already separated from the soil by enclosures into the cities as urban factory workers. The US process was different. It split into two different sections. In the free colonies in the north and in the west you had petty commodity producers were dispossessed by debt and forced to become urban workers. And this dispossession by debt is not something which was characteristic of Europe. It was something that was specific to the free colonies of the United States. 
in the South, you have a slave mode of production, you then have the Civil War, and then you have a semi-feudal mode of production. Why do I say semi-feudal? Because the extraction of the surplus is an extraction from a peasantry who are forced to give part of their crop to the landlords. This is no different in principle from giving part of their working day to the landlords. Mechanisation is then what drives them off the land. So, this is a process which really is going on in the 20th century. Starts to get underway in the 1880s and 1890s, but really reaches its peak in the period from the 1930s to the early 1950s, when you get the vast migration into the big industries of uh, the car industries, the mass production industries of the north. And this is quite different from the processes that took place in Europe. And it is a projection back for American um, liberals to say that the South was always capitalist. No, it wasn't. It was a distinct mode of production. It wasn't based on the separation of the population from the soil. And America wasn't capitalist in general until the late 19th century. It was a predominantly peasant agricultural nation. 